Please join me as we call ourselves to worship. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from trouble and gathered from the lands. among men my example is he word became flesh and the light shined among us his glory revealed living he loved
come before the presence of God and recognize our need to confess our sins. And as we have this context here on this Memorial Day weekend, it carries a lot more weight for us to reflect upon what sacrifice Jesus has made for our sakes to secure our freedom, freedom from sin. So I have my cheat sheet here. I'm going to invite you to follow along as we pray this prayer of confession together, saying, Dear God, on this Memorial Day weekend, we know that we have forgotten. We have forgotten to rest in your provision. We have forgotten to pursue justice. We have forgotten to bite our tongues. Too quickly we remember how we have been offended. Too quickly we remember how we have suffered. Too quickly we remember our own personal needs. Lord, please forgive us. Not only has this time of social distancing forced us to step back from the regular routine of life, this weekend calls upon us to step into a posture of remembering those who have made the ultimate sacrifice to secure our freedom. Beyond a military engagement, you, Lord, have secured for us a victory over death, and you have called upon us to live our lives in humble reliance upon you with compassion toward others. Help us to remember this. We pray all this through your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. friends you are just in time would you like to go on a little hike with me I was gonna go find a quiet spot and then I figured maybe we could read God's Word together but before we go any further I have to check something in my backpack because I packed I packed a water bottle and I packed a Bible but this backpack feels way heavier than it should so let's see what's going on here hmm all right so here's the Bible. Oh my goodness, boys and girls. What is this doing in my backpack? Oh, wait a minute. I didn't pack this. And another one. And another one. You know what? I think Mr. Greg put him in here to tr play a trick on me. He knew I was going for a walk, and so he probably thought, oh, this would be funny. I'm going to get you later, Mr. Greg. You know what, though? Sometimes we actually do this, though. Now, you probably don't put rocks in your backpack and carry them around, but sometimes we carry around things that we don't have to, like, like our fears or our worries or our sadness, we try to carry that by ourselves. And that can get really heavy. And yet, in God's word, we're told we don't have to carry those things by ourselves. In fact, in 1 Peter chapter 5, it says this, it says, cast all your cares on Jesus because he cares for you. And so, we don't have to carry these heavy things by ourselves. We can, we can give them to Jesus and he will help us with that. That's really good news. And you know what? That actually reminds me of a song. This is a song I used to sing. Oh my gosh, I loved it. I was a camp counselor. It was one of my favorites. And the words are really simple. It just says, cast your burdens. Burdens are like your worries, your fears, sadness. Cast those unto Jesus, for he cares for you. This is a really simple song. It repeats itself a bunch of times. It's a dance around the living room song. So everyone get on up and please join me. We're gonna sing it now. Come on everybody, let's give a song of praise to the Lord. Cast your burdens unto Jesus, for he cares for you. To Jesus, for he cares for you. Higher, 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 Jesus, higher, 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 Jesus, higher, cast your burdens unto Jesus, for he cares for you. Cast your burdens unto Jesus. 
Jesus For he cares Jesus for singing with us friends well you know what I'm not gonna put these rocks back in my backpack because that doesn't make any sense but I am going to toss them off this path kind of put them back in the woods where they came from <sighs> isn't that a relief that weight is off of me what a relief just like when we take our cares and our worries to Jesus what a relief please join me in prayer simply repeat after me Dear Jesus, we thank you that you love us and you care for us and we can take our worries to you. Amen. Have a great week, everyone. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Okay, so what do you know? Here we are in the youth room. Yeah like old home. It is. And you're going to a place where you're going to be able to continue the spirit of this place. Yeah. I'm, I'm really excited to share the news that I um, accepted a position. Um, and it's basically like my dream job. So I, I cannot wait to start. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about it. Yeah. So it's an associate pastor position. Um, and I'm focusing in youth and missions. Um, and as a lot of people know, youth is definitely where my passions lie in ministry. And I love missions, so it's basically I get to do everything I really am passionate about. But I also get to have the opportunity to preach and be a part of worship as well. Um, and I'm moving south, which I've always wanted to do because oh, I boy. hate the cold. <laughs> so it's just a win-win. I'm very, I'm so excited. Right. Awesome. Yeah, you can't tell us exactly where it is yet because when does the church vote? Yeah, so the congregational meeting is on the 31st. Okay. And if all goes well, I'll start the 1st. Fantastic. So, yeah. yeah. You got moving vans all ready to go yeah. and the relationship with the senior pastor. Tell us a little bit about this guy. Yeah, he's great. Um, he's um, in his 40s. He's been at the church for about seven years and we just get it along very, very well. Good. Um, he has a lot of great ideas and I feel like I can definitely talk about him about my ideas. Right. So I'm just excited to be able to work with him and um, he seems like the kind of person who will help me um, as I enter into this new stage. Right. And you know what's really fun is I think about this and your last day here with us at yeah. Hampton, but you're always, this is your home, you know, this will always be your home church um, and you're always welcome to be back here for sure. Thank you. But the beautiful thing that's happening here 
is this Sunday. And I don't know if you realize this, but in the liturgical calendar, in our own kind of church calendar that we observe, this Sunday is Ascension Sunday. And it's the day that Jesus goes up into heaven. And I love the scene there. You know, because here all the disciples are hanging around. Jesus is giving them the Great Commission, which is all about going out and doing mission and all this kind of jazz. And, and Jesus saying to his disciples, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. I give it to you. <laughs> and so he said, go and teach and baptize. And so he's giving him this Great Commission. That's what it's called, the Great Commission. And so likewise, this congregation, myself, Ryan, and those who have gone before, Ryan, and all who have nurtured you into this place, are all gathering behind you saying, go, go, do what you're going to do. And the thing that I love about this part of Ascension Sunday is after Jesus ascends into the clouds, the disciples, what did they do? They, they just stood there, staring up into the clouds. <laughs> they were like, Wait. And sometimes isn't that the feel that we might have as we're leaving a place of security or we feel like, oh no, yeah. oh, what am I going to do? You know, what's going to happen next? And I love that God sends these angels down <laughs> to the disciples. And what's the angel say to the disciples? Go. Yeah. What are you still doing here? <laughs> what are you guys doing here looking up in the heavens, man? <laughs> Didn't he just tell you you got to do something? Yeah. You know? And so likewise, you know, this is a beautiful beautiful Sunday for you. You know, we can easily get caught up and just say, ah, oh, it's nice to sit down here. It's nice to relish the memories mm -hmm. and, and to think deep into that. But we can't stay here. Yeah. You've got to move. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly how I feel. I mean, I feel very nervous and anxious about the unknown, but I'm so excited as well. But I mean, you're right. Like, this is my home and I feel so comfortable here and I'm I'm nervous about leaving this wonderful, comfortable, loving place, but I mean, yeah, I definitely also feel that excitement and that um, push to, to go, right. and um, it's not that scary. There is scary parts about it, because I've grown up in Pittsburgh, never lived somewhere new, but ultimately, like, I, I know that I'm not going alone, and right. that um, it's definitely what I feel God is calling me to do. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Well, one thing that I, I want to be able to give to you. Now, last week I was able to show off the piece that I made for for Dawn and her going away gift. Yeah. Um, I can't show yours off right now. Okay. <laughs> it's still on the workbench. Great. It's slated according to the work schedule that I have set up <laughs> to be done on Saturday. So maybe, folks, we're recording right now on Wednesday. So quite possibly I'll be able to show you the finished product on Saturday. But I'm going to describe it to you, uh, what I want to be able to give to you on this, on this auspicious occasion. Because you're going to be going out. You're going to be doing as Jesus even commissioned. Go and preach and baptize. Administer the sacraments, right? And so what I have made for you is a small traveling communion kit. And it's made out of walnut, which is a domestic precious hardwood which also is in our communion table, right? That mm -hmm. little part in the middle of the fish where it shows the people, that's walnut. It also has on the top a stripe of cherry in it because the table's made of cherry. So there's a lot of connections that ties you back to your home church and to your people who've nurtured you here, but all the symbolism that's in there. Um, so you'll have that. Now, as I spoke with you about what your desire would be for if you had a communion kit and how you do that, and blah, blah, blah. So what I've done is I've turned a cup, a chalice for you. So there's a little wooden chalice. It's made of three different woods. Um, one, is, uh, what is, one is popular. And the other is uh, red oak. And the centerpiece is uh, mahogany. And so it has these three stripes. It represents the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And it's all turned, and, and uh, you know, you guys will get a chance to see it. And you'll see it when I get it to you. And so that will sit inside there. And then there's also, I purchased a little veil to go, or vial to be able to carry your, your communion juice with. And then you can slip a chunk of bread in there. Awesome. And uh, the way it's designed is that the lid 
totally comes off, so you can use it as a table. And so no matter where you are, you'll be able to set your communion elements up on your little mini table, and you'll have it. Now, the box itself is really interesting. I purposefully put components into the box that reminds us of our own brokenness and our own frailty. So um, within the box, you'll see there's a giant knot at one part of the box, and there's another piece where there's a chunk taken out, you know, it's like where a worm had gone in and chewed it through, and it's really gorgeous. I mean, it is absolutely, I'm so jazzed by this, but all of that is indicative that, okay, we don't come before the presence of God with perfection. We come as broken people, and we come with our weirdnesses and all our little quirks and goofiness and our sinfulness and our brokenness. And God says, come. Come to me who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And this is what I pray for you as well. As you go out, and God will rest upon you, and you'll have that peace as you minister for the sake of the kingdom. Thank you. Great work <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, this has been awesome. I can't say thank you enough to this church and, and to you. Um, not only were you my home church, but you also were a teaching church for my field ed. And I just, I feel like I've grown so much just within this past year, but like all my life you've been a witness to the growth that's been happening. And I mean, that, that gift is so special because now I get to take a piece of Hampton Presbyterian Church with me. And uh, that's amazing. So thank you yeah. so much. Oh, for sure. <laughs> Well, friends, uh, keep Casey in prayer, and I'm going to invite us to pray right now as we send her on her way. So let's, let's pray. Lord God Almighty, thank you so very much for this treasure that we've been able to share in life, and that is a, a mutual ability to reflect your love to the larger community at whole, as, on a whole, and to see how Casey has gone through the different epochs of Christian growth here in this church how you continue to nurture her. So even now as we send her on on this Ascension Sunday, even as Jesus sent his disciples on, we pray your blessing upon her and that she would speak with boldness and with compassion and that you would enfold her with your angels to keep her safe. We thank you for the precious gift of community and the opportunity to share and fellowship one another. We pray that the people down south would readily welcome her and enfold her into their fellowship. It's in your son's precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, friend. We'll see you around. This is the Old Testament reading from Psalm 68, 32 through 35. Sing praise to the Lord, to him who rides across the highest heavens, the ancient heavens, who thunders with mighty voice. Proclaim the power of God, whose majesty is over Israel whose power is in the heavens. You, God, are awesome in your sanctuary. The God of Israel gives power and strength to his people. Praise be to God.
of God now rejoicing in Christ. Carry your joy to the darkness of night. Tell the world, tell the world, He is alive. Hear the good news of His glorious day. Every heart singing as heaven proclaims He is Lord. Peter chapter 5 verses 6 through 11. So be content with who you are and don't put on airs. God's strong hand is on you. He'll promote you at the right time. Live carefree before God. He is most careful with you. Keep a cool head. Stay alert. The devil is poised to pounce and would like nothing better than to catch you napping. Keep your guard up. You're not the only ones who plunged into these hard times. It's the same with Christians all over the world. So keep a firm grip on faith. The suffering won't last forever. It won't be long before this generous God who has great plans for us in Christ, eternal and glorious plans they are, will have you put together and on your feet for good. He gets the last word. Yes, he does. Hey, you know, Ryan, with all this walking that we've been having to do, I've caught up on a lot of movies lately. I've been watching a ton of movies. Yeah, uh, we've been watching movies, too, on Netflix. Although, we we lost this movie that my daughter got for her birthday. We can't find it anywhere. Oh, I saw that on Facebook. You were mentioning that. Yeah, yeah was... Moana. Like, we were trying to introduce her to Disney movies. and Can't find yeah, it. Can't find it. Disappeared. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I suggested it maybe if it was frozen, it'd be in the freezer. Yeah, we looked in the freezer. It's, it's not, not there. there. So. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, coming out here and walking in this, this reminds me of this other great Disney movie. I don't know if Sarah has seen this one yet. I don't know. And it's probably too, too young to be able to see it. But that movie, The Lion King. Oh, yeah. And there's that one scene where you have Mufasa and Simba. They're walking along and Mufasa's talking about, this is all going to be yours one day, blah, blah, blah. And there's... Zazu giving the daily yeah. report. And Mufasa looks at Simba and says, what are you doing? Because he's trying to pounce on this grasshopper. Yeah. And, and then Simba says, well, I'm, I'm pouncing. And Mufasa says, let me show you how it's done. And then all of a sudden, you know, it's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. there's Zazu standing there. He's like talking away, blah, 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 blah. And all of a sudden, you know, it's cool. It's a great scene. I love it. And I think it speaks dynamically to even our text that we have for today. Yeah. yeah, it's sweet. The thing I love about Disney movies is the reality, they've got so many great things. You know, I, I grew up and I was, I watched Cool Runnings and the Jamaican bobsled team. And, you know, they took these sprinters who were going to be Olympians and they redeemed it. And, these people in Jamaica would never experience cold, and yeah, and then there was that other movie, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. That was so cool. Like they shrunk down and, and they were lost, and they went on this adventure. And Ted, where'd you go? Ted. He was right here. Ted? Did you guys see where he went? Ted? 
Well, I didn't find him behind that bush. Which one do you think he's behind? Oh, hey! There he is. Gone again. Dead. Surely he's behind this bush over here. Dad! Oh! Dad! You found me? Yeah. Good luck. Ah! He's gone again. This game of hide and go seek is beginning to get really old. There are so many bushes here in this field. Where is he gonna go next? Hmm. I don't know, I'm gonna start going this way down the path. Pounce! <laughs> oh, friends, take a few moments now, to talk about a movie that you've really enjoyed and maybe one of those movies that really caught you by surprise and you didn't know when it was coming. Ah, uh, you know, Ryan, we don't want to get ahead of ourselves uh, as we're coming up out of the woods there. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> it sure was fun. It never hurts to play a little hide-and-go-seek, you know? <laughs> <That's>, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, there are two important things to our text. Aside from where we were, you know, kind of directing ourselves with that opening scene that we had out in the field. But this one aspect here, I think we really need to look at a love in the text that was read to us by that beautiful, loving couple that's about to get married. I mean, Emily and Luke, oh, I'm so excited for them. And, uh, but this text here, that we need to recenter ourselves around what Peter is saying as he brings this first letter to a close to all those disciples in Diaspora. You know, they're spread all over the place. And remember what the situation is. We spoke about this before when we first, we've been living in First Peter all this time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, so he comes and, and revisits an idea that he's mentioned already once before. And, and uh, he says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. Wow. Yeah. And that comes as an imperative. You know, he's like, this is what you have to do. You know. Well, and he's tapping into what he learned from Jesus. Yeah. You know, Jesus talks to us about coming humbly like a child. And I mean, in those days, children were viewed as the, the low of the low. Right, right. And then, as we even mentioned, you know, Paul captured a few weeks back when we were up at Hampton Community Park, and we talked about that whole thing, a kenosis passage, you know, and Jesus emptying himself, taking on the form of a servant, that whole reality of humility. Yeah, yeah and I love the image that we use there as Jesus is talking about prayer, and he's giving the example of, you know, the Pharisee that you think would be praying in the right way, right. and then this sinner. Right. And he says, no, you need to be like this sinner because that Pharisee is using all these fancy words and trying to bring all the attention to himself, whereas the sinner was just humble and said, hey, I'm a sinner and, and I need grace. Right, exactly. And that's the other part where Matthew records this, you know, Jesus lowers the boom on those Pharisees and the scribes and the hypocrites. And he says, man, you guys are like whitewashed tombs, you know, all this stuff. And the seven woes. And at the end of all of that, he, he says, those who are exalted shall be humbled. And the humbled will be exalted. You know, wow. Such a powerful dynamic as we look at that and, and how we understand, you know, you, you, you think about, you know, Peter's life. <laughs> right, yeah, I mean, Peter would have known a lot about this. He himself was humbled <laughs> by Jesus. Yeah. Uh, you know, he was a, a zealous person, and sometimes that, and Jesus yeah. throttled it back. Yeah, he throttled him back. And, and how about uh, that other story, you know, where oh, throttled? Well, he got to see someone getting throttled back, yeah. Uh, James and John and them oh. arguing over who gets the, the special seat. The primo seat, yeah. Right. 
And you could just see Peter just seething with this at the time that it took place. Who made you guys the king of the universe? Right. You know, wait a minute, I thought it was the three of us, Peter, James, and John, and so you're going to jump ahead of me? Right. You know, and here's Peter, he's writing this going, all right, here's the deal. <laughs> you got to humble yourselves because, oh, man, Peter saw it. And he saw it, and I'm sure, even as he was getting hot and bothered by his fishing buddies for their kajungas, you know, the next thing you know, he, he's like, oh, yeah. So the question for us, my friends, is what's so hard about humility? Why is this so difficult for us? Take a few moments. Talk about it. You know, the thing that's so hard about humility is the fact that we have such an investment in who we are and even as our world, you know, kind of shapes us to be able to get out there and make a name for ourselves, to be assertive. So, and our identity is established in that, right? And what we're able to do and how we're able to convince others that we have the capacity to do what's being laid before us. And so that, that it creates a complication for us, right? You know, it, really, it really does. It, it does. And I think along with that, there's, there's an element of fear that plays into this too. Um, you know, the world's a harsh place. Yeah. And so people think to themselves, man, like if I'm not looking out for myself, if I'm just, if I'm being humble and they take humble as like letting mm -hmm. someone just roll all over them. Yeah. And they're like, well, you know, I can't be humble then because if I'm humble and people are just taking advantage of me. BTO, that, baby. Yeah, that's that's right. not going to be good yeah. either. And so some of that is just, you know, who's, who's going to care for me if I'm humble right. and not understanding what humility really is. That's exactly. Yeah, and that fear starts to drive us that way. And so fear's bringing this out because in the context of this, you know, what we have here is first he's addressing those who have been set aside to be leaders in the church. You know, folks like you and me. Right. And then others who are leaders within the church. And then he encompasses everybody. And isn't it the, the fact that when you're given a, a, a position of authority or something like that, well, then all of a sudden you're like, hey, well, hey, I'm the best thing since sliced bread, you know. And you right. start taking a little more control, and, and there is a bit of fear there, because all of a sudden you're like, well, gee whiz, this could evaporate, and right. who am I then? Right. And you think about, here's the fearful part that's happened during this COVID time. There are lots of folks who have lost their jobs, which impacts their identity. Right. Who am I? You know, if you go to like a dinner party, or you can't go to any parties now, or some kind of right. little exchange with folks, you know, as a... Uh, you know, some uh, gathering. What's the first thing that you say when you introduce yourself to some, or somebody introduces you to somebody else? Well, it's normally, you know, what do you do for a living? Yeah. This is Ryan. He's a preacher. You know, that's where your identity is. You know, it's in the job that you do. Well, and that starts when you're in adolescence. You're asking that question, who am I? Right. Yeah. And so that's what I love about the text that Peter's bringing to the people here who are really struggling and trying to understand. And so when we get this imperative, humble yourself, and, and that kind of rubs us, rubs our fur the wrong way a little bit, you know, because we're in a dog-eat-dog -dog kind of world. Right. And, then, and then you come to this next sentence, and it doesn't appear in our translation in the way that it communicates grammatically for us because it comes off as almost like another imperative you know cast your anxieties on him you know this is another action that you have to do but the beauty of this is that Peter is giving them an identity and it's a twofold kind of identity which is really kind of fun so as you look at this you see this image of 
what Peter is, is uh, drawing for them and how we can likewise assume this understanding and lay it as our own. It says, first and foremost, this word here, it's a, um, a participle. So in essence, what Peter is saying is that you want to be ones who cast. Yeah. Right? So there's an identity right there. You're an individual that's throwing things. Yeah. Well, here we are, Memorial Day weekend. You know, and I'm, first thing that comes to my mind when you're thinking about pitching stuff, you know, what, what do you think about? Well, my mind goes to Boston. <laughs> right? Yeah. You know, here a bunch of guys are pitching tea over the side of the boat. And, and what was that for? To prove they want to be released from the shackles of the tyrannical, you know, reign of King Charles III. Like, we're, no, we're, we are our own nation. We don't need to pay these taxes. And, and there's this image of this is who we are. And they're living into that. They're casting the tea in. They're making a statement. And so likewise for us, we're not going to allow, you know, the, the pressure of sin and the shackle of sin to define us, you know, because fear right. is built on sin. Arrogance built on sin. You know, everything that speaks against the essence of the gospel points to our fallen nature. And Peter's saying, you need to be thinking of this guy that's pitching stuff. And we're like, okay, so I got that. And he says, here's why you're the guy that's pitching stuff. Because, and this is really the fun part, you know, I think the old King James says, cast your cares upon him, you know, because, here's the other part of it, this is the parallel, yeah. because he cares for you. Now, in the Greek, this is really powerful. The word there is shaping an image that this is a really precious object that the individual cares for. So to have this image that Jesus deeply cares for you, like your grandmother's special plate or something that you receive, and he's going to hold that right. with that kind of tenderness, with that kind of real regard. You know, that, I think, is awesome imagery. So it lives into the fear that I was talking about. We don't have to fear because we know we're not going to get run over. We've got a good shepherd right. that cares for us. Exactly. And that's where our identity is. You know, our identity really isn't in what we do as a job. Our identity is not in how well we can convince somebody that we're X, Y, and Z, or the greatest thing since sliced bread. Our identity is in the Creator who called us. Yeah. who loves us and cares for us, you know? And, and to have that idea, you know, all of a sudden, everything from the Sermon on the Mount starts to rush in on us, mm. right? You know, don't worry. What are you worried about? Your Heavenly Father knows what you need. You're like, wow, that's right. So cast your cares over the starboard side and recognize that you are an object of deep care. So my friends, the question that I have for you at this time is, you know, throughout our lifetime, we've assumed different identities, right? And some of these identities that we have assumed, we've done so either by willingly or they've been imposed upon us, or, you know, there's just been a recognition that has been kind of laid upon us. Um, I take a moment to think through, how is it that you have even matured through your understanding of who you are? before a holy God. Well, I hope you've had a really good conversation about the reality of identity and, and how you've come to understand yourself and and all those uh, realities of life that you've experienced. So we come back to our text, 
And it's here, it's interesting, because I feel as if there should be a therefore. Because Peter has established this with the reader. This is who you are. This is what you're up against. And so, since that's in place, here's where you, we need to be really focusing our attention, right? And that is to be sober-minded and watchful. Because... Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And that's that image that we were having fun with at the very beginning. You know, Zazu and Mufasa and Simba. You know? Yeah, now I, I think it's important to acknowledge, though, that it's, it's a slow prowling that happens. You know, as we get caught up in sin, it's small, subtle things that happen over time. But there, there definitely is kind of this mastermind scheming. So uh, a book that was kind of shocking for me as I read it was uh, C.S. Lewis's The Screwtape Letters. Right. Um, and, and in this book, it's these series of letters back and forth between kind of like this the senior devil uh, screw tape and kind of like his nephew Wormwood and he's having conversations back and forth of, well, how do I get my person to be caught up in this sin? And you can see just the little subtle things. Well, that's exactly what uh, screw tape tells Wormwood because Wormwood comes up with these, you know, these elaborate kind of spook them kind of ideas right. and let's hit them hard right away. And, right. and screw tape's like, no, 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 no. You just do the little here and there. And then all of a sudden, boom, you've right. got him. It's kind of like that lion that's right. prowling, prowling. And Zazu has no idea. And then, pow! Next thing you know, you're gone. You know, you've been hit by the temptation. You find yourself deep in a pool that you wished you never would have been in. Right. You know, and, you know, and uh, I think about that as we were even mentioned uh, the early, early settlers here in America. Right. And, you know, here they come, Mayflower in 1620, they sail across and land, and they create the Mayflower Pact. Right. These that, guys... It was a great community to start with. Yes, they had a huge commitment to wanting to make sure that they lived into a life of faith, a place of real devotion, and to have a, a full-mindedness of the community and what it means to live in community. Well, um, within this, this is a marvelous book as well. I'm going to highly recommend this. If you're looking for a devotional book, then let me highly recommend this one, this Faith and Culture. Um, it a, takes a peek at all these uh, inf influential individuals from science, from the humanities, from uh, ecology and economics, and politics, everything, and looks at it and, and talks about uh, how we can understand our faith in these different places. Well, one of the entries in here was about the Mayflower Pact. And, and, it, and the author there mentions the reality that, you know, it only took two generations for the Mayflower Pact to become so diluted that it had no value anymore within the community. It had just... His slow, slow, inattention, not being sober-minded, not being watchful, the elements of our own sinfulness erode the real desire to want to live a life of righteousness right? because of our nature, of who we are, fallen creatures. And Satan, wormwood, screw tape, <laughs> takes advantage of these things, you know? Well, so I think we find ourselves in a, a, a bad position when we're focusing just on self. Right. Right? If we think about this like, oh, man, I'm in this, I'm in this bad position. My, my rights are being taken advantage of. And you start kind of spiraling and you, you're so focused on self. Um, I think what I love in this, this first Peter passage is he's, he's getting us to think outside of just ourselves. Oh yeah, you know that's that's the really powerful. I'm glad you brought that up because, um, you know, when we find ourselves being tempted or uh, afflicted 
or persecuted like these guys were, or finding ourselves in a place of suffering because of the sin that may have clung to us so tightly, and we're impacted by it, we get into the posture, oh, woe is me, you know, right. why is this happening to me, yeah, 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 the Lord's forgotten about me, you know, I'm all alone in this, I'm adrift in a sea of misery, blah, blah, blah. Right. You know, and the reality of Peter says here, which is really, really powerful, he says, well, first off, he says, resist Satan, standing firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering, right, this is huge, are being experienced by your brother and sisterhood throughout the world. Yeah, so it's this, this awesome image. We're, we've got this community. We have right. sisters and brothers in Christ that have experienced some of the temptations, have been able to make it through some, but like work together as right. this community, not just this lone wolf in the journey by ourselves. Right. Right, and we, and as we step into our time of prayer, and even in our imprecatory statements before God, say, Lord, is God, please, you know, these, these supplications that we have, we can temper those to be more globally minded. Right. And to recognize. You know, and even the author of Hebrews makes it absolutely clear for us. He says, you know, we have a great high priest who is not unfamiliar with our predicament. But he had not sinned. That's the difference. You know, Jesus comes, knows what it's like to live in this world, to endure the suffering that's present here, to face the temptations, even as the author of Hebrews says, he was tempted in every way, but didn't sin. And he's familiar with our sufferings. And so all of a sudden, not only has he given us an identity that says, I care for you, right? And you are an object of care. He now gives us this greater identity as well, or expanded identity, let's put it that way, an expanded identity of who we are in the global community, that we are connected one to another and that we should look beyond self all the time even in our suffering. And that we are humbled in that. And to know that we need to be in prayer. Because Satan uses every one of those little places, man, just to... Tch, tch. And if we're not attentive to that, we're going to find ourselves in a very scary place. Well, and <laughs> he just pops up in front of the lens. <laughs> so. And community can help us see things that we, we can't see. And support us in those. That's absolutely right. And so that's the, the thing that I want us to think about, my friends, is uh, we go off for another uh, time of uh, questioning and, and, and conversation with each other. You know, and take a moment and discuss where are those blind spots? What is your blind spot? Maybe you've never even thought about it. But to take a few moments to think, where's my blind spot where I am susceptible to where Satan comes in, where I need to be sober-minded, where I need to be that person that's watchful, because that's what you're doing. We, we can't be asleep at the wheel here, my friends. As we come back in, we've spent some time thinking about our blind spots. It can, you know, feel a little bit hopeless, like we've acknowledged these areas that we could be in trouble to sin. And so, what does Peter say about our insurance here, Ted? <laughs> you know, that's a very good question because it could leave you deeply hanging in a very despondent place. Right, yeah, we can't stop you know, here in this right. Don't turn it off. <laughs> Okay, I've fallen asleep at the wheel one more, one too many times. I've uh, succumbed over here. I know I'm weak, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, Ted, come on. There's got to be some hope in the midst of all this. Well, there is. You know, not only is there the hope that you have cared by Christ, but, 
here's the thing that Peter goes on with the people who are reading this, you know, those who are receiving this letter. And we get into verse 10. And it's a timeline, right? It's not a matter of, you know, it's a switch, but this is a timeline. It's almost like when you have done this, then comes this, right? So it says, and after you have suffered a little while, and you got to love this little, you know, parenthetical statement is in the text. It says, the God of all grace, right? So for us to, to recognize that and remember that reality, we are dealing with a God who called us into existence, a God who cares for us, and a God who has expressed grace and mercy to us. So he's not out to condemn us, like you mentioned a few weeks back. You know, from yeah. the Romans passage, you know, he's not looking to... We're, we're not a little ants with him, him having a magnifying glass trying to, to yeah. fry us. Right, right. And so, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, right? So there's a, there's a destiny that we receive. That God is calling us into this eternal relationship with him through Christ. Wow. And so, yeah, we're going to suffer. As we suffer, even the Beatitudes, as Jesus is telling his disciples, and I look at him kind of as a, one progresses to the next, and he says, and you will be persecuted. He doesn't say you might be persecuted. He says, you will be persecuted <laughs> for your faith. And that's exactly what's happening here with these people at the time that this was written under Nero and, and uh, who else was I mentioning? I can't remember right now. The other, you know, Caesar that was kind of off the rails. Um, and, and so he comes to this final statement and he identifies what I'm going to call four little Easter eggs that just kind of pop up and you find them and you go, wow, that's awesome. And so you have these four Easter eggs. It says, and the eternal glory of Christ will himself, what this is what Jesus is going to do to you and do for you. He's going to restore you. He's going to confirm who you are and confirm the grace that he has lavished upon you, right? And he's going to strengthen you, right? And lastly, he's going to establish you. And when I think about these four things, and as we play all the way back to the essence of humility and our concern about people taking, you know, recognizing us as an individual of worth, well, gee whiz, Jesus has already taken care of that. Because everything that we, the restoration, confirmation, strengthening, and establishing, these are things that speak of value to the person and things that bring us assurance and hope and, and, and confidence, right? And so this is what we see, my friends, as we bring First Peter to a close on this Ascension Day that uh, Jesus tells his disciples, you know, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me, and I'm telling you, go and teach. Don't be afraid. And remember who you are, and have that assurance. God has confirmed that for you, and he will strengthen you. And it's a glorious day. Blessings to you, my friends. As we come to this part of the service, it's important to remember things, like remembering our baptism that was here. And one of the ways that we're able to do that is to recite an affirmation of faith together, remembering those core truths. So I invite you to join me as we say the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, and he ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Rick, it's good to have you here, man, and uh, just be able to get an assessment of where we stand financially at the church and mm -hmm. as a member of the Stewardship Committee. Just give us a brief kind of synopsis of where we are, what we've done in the last couple of weeks here. Well, Ted, the uh, 
at our last stewardship committee meeting, uh, going over the first quarter of the year, the stewardship committee was concerned that giving might be down. We found that actually it was better than anticipated, even though we still were slightly below budget. Um, and then we had the decision to make, should we and how much give to our missions? We decided to follow Jesus Christ's teachings and still give our 10% from our first fruits. So we gave the full 10% to our missions. And here are just a few of the letters thanking us from all our different local, national, international missions um, for not abandoning them during this time and leaving them stranded. It's bought PPE and food and other necessary items. Um, so in doing that, God came through again. How did that uh, happen? Well, April's giving not only caught us back up to our budget, but slightly surpassed it. Now, we had help in that the utility costs were down also, mm -hmm. But it, it just goes to show, like my mother-in-law always said, you cannot outgive God. And <laughs> he come through again for us. So I'd like to thank all the congregation for continuing to support Hampton Presbyterian Church during this time. And also our staff for doing such a great job with these videos and services every Sunday, keeping us going when a lot of our churches are shut down or just having a, their pastor sitting in his office and giving a little brief synopsis of the, the week or uh, service and where our church has continued to try to get the community involved and the congregation involved and I appreciate all the work that other people have put into this also. Right. So at this time we're doing well as far as our budget we're up even with our budget so continue to support Hampton Presbyterian Church and I thank you again for all your giving and support of this church. Thanks so much, Rick. You're welcome. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for the many blessings you give us. Please use us and use the gifts we give back to you so that your kingdom here on earth reflects heaven and, and people come to know your love. Amen.
friends, the message that we've faced today warned us that the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Standing here next to this battle gun, we realize that we don't fight a battle of flesh and blood, but of powers and principalities. We recognize that we need to stand firm before the wiles of Satan who seeks to distract us and destroy us and create chaos. And we need to be alert to that, even as we step into a life of humility. So friends, as you go out into the world this week, facing the trials that you may encounter, recognize that God has not left you abandoned and that he has rescued you and takes you into the loving embrace of his compassion. So go forth with confidence, my friends. Go forth knowing that you have an identity, an identity as one who is cared for, and that you can live into each day with confidence. So go in peace, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Let the people of God say, Amen.